I just want to take a minute to say thank you to the band and to the guys back there in the booth. They make all this look really easy, but it's not. They work really hard to put this together, and they do a fantastic job. So let's give them a round of applause. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning humbled that you would even think of us, that you would send your Holy Spirit to flood this place, fill the atmosphere. God, we ask that you be, you be with those affected by Hurricane Matthew as they're struggling to, to make sense of life right now. God, I ask that you would speak to each one of us here this morning, that we may hear you and feel your presence. In the name of Jesus, amen. Last week, we talked about spiritual dehydration. And I believe Pastor Carl was, was down here last week uh, talking about what it's like to be dehydrated and, what, what, and how you become dehydrated. Now, let me ask you this. What comes before dehydration? How do you know you're dehydrated? Or a good way, an, another way to ask is when you haven't had enough water to drink, what's that feeling you get? Thirst. You're thirsty. That's right. Now, this week, we're going to talk about quenching our thirst. When you've been outside working in the yard or maybe up in the back of a tractor trailer unloading pumpkins, <laughs> you are, you're poor in sweat, and you are hot. And when you finally get done, the first thing you do is go for a nice, cold drink of water. Mm. And I mean, that first sip. Whew, there is nothing like that first cold sip of water when you've been out there sweating and you're hot. But that whole bottle of water is just so good. Now, I'm going to tell you a quick story. And this happened before my wife and I had three kids. We don't have time for this now. I think we just had one at the time, um, but he was with grandparents. We... My wife and I went up to uh, Table Rock one weekend. Has anybody ever been to Table Rock, hiked up? All right, excellent. It's a, it's a pretty long hike. The trail up to the actual part of the mountain that it's named for is, um, <clears throat> excuse me, is 3.6 miles one way. But when you get to the top, it is beautiful. I mean, it is gorgeous. And we started up the mountain that day, and we, we maybe made it half a mile. We, ba we had barely gotten started when my wife sat down, and uh, I could tell she didn't feel too good. And I was already preparing in my mind. She was about to say, let's leave. And I was just like, we did not drive two hours to get here to turn around now. But being the wonderful, supportive husband that I am, I said, here, have a banana. <laughs> now, she felt a little better after she ate something, and we kept going. I told her we could leave, but she knew in the back of her mind how highly annoyed I would be if we had to leave. And I would sulk all day long. And I got even more annoyed because she was right. I would do that. <laughs> we made it to the top. I'm so proud of her. She's never going to do it again, but she did it that day. <laughs> and we sat down. We had a Gatorade, and we enjoyed the, the view for a little bit. And then we, we headed back down the mountain. Now, I'm going to do the math for you real quick. 3.6 miles up. And 3.6 miles down is 7.2 miles total. That's a pretty long walk if it's flat. But this is up a mountain and then down a mountain. It's two different muscle groups you're using the whole entire time. <clears throat> and we got back to the trailhead, and I went in the bathroom to change clothes and fill up about 12 water bottles. And when I got to the car, she'd already laid her seat back, and she was passed out. Just... 
I shook her. I said, are you okay? She wouldn't wake up. She was out. And so I, I kind of looked over and I put my hand in front of her mouth. I said, okay, she's breathing. And I, was, I just started driving. I headed towards Greenville because I was like, they got restaurants there and there's a hospital there. And she needs one or both of those things right now. <laughs> so, we, so I'm just driving along. And 30, 30 minutes later, 30 minutes later, she sits up like this. <gasps> five guys. <laughs> just like that, I swear. <laughs> Points at five guys. So I pull in. I cannot tell you how much food we ate and how much water we drank. I mean, ugh. She'll tell you today that's the closest she's ever come to death. <laughs> she was thirsty and hungry. We both were. Now, usually when we say, I'm thirsty, we usually mean that we need water. But there's a lot of things that we thirst for, right? Sex, money, power, entertainment, fun, fulfillment, acceptance, love. I used to hear people say, only God can fill that void. And in fact, in some of our discussions among the pastors, this week we've said only God can quench that thirst. And a few years ago, I would look at that list and go, only God can quench that thirst. Hmm. Did they not see the first one on that list? I'm, I'm not quite sure how God is going to quench that thirst for me. Because we don't, we don't talk about sex in church a lot. It's taboo. It's kind of like talking about it with your parents. No, thank you. <laughs> my parents were supposed to be here today, but my little boy's with them. He threw up this morning, so they're not here. He probably knew I was going to talk about it. <laughs> but... That's not the only thing on the list that, that we don't associate with God or church. What about fun? How many, of you have, how many of you have ever been to a church that's just not fun and don't call out names? Okay. There's a few of you. The, the point is, God's not supposed to fill each and every one of those needs for us. And none of those, none of those things are necessarily bad. I mean, you wouldn't be here without... Sex. Money. It's not bad. People get, conf get confused and think money is the root of all evil. But that's not what it says in 1 Timothy 6. It says, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Power. Not necessarily bad. If it's wielded wisely and compassionately, it can be a good thing. In fact, God has power. Would you agree? It's not wrong to have fun or to be fulfilled or to be accepted or to be loved. The point I'm trying to make is that we use, we try to use sex, money, power, fun, acceptance, other things to fill a void, to quench our thirst. But just like that bottle of water, you're going to run out. It only quenches your thirst temporarily. It leaves you wanting more. Only God can quench our thirst. And only Jesus can give us that living water. That brings us to our scripture today. It comes from John chapter 4. And you can turn there if you brought a Bible or you pull it up on your Bible app or we've got it up on the screen for you. Um, I believe that's NIV version on the screen. I'm, I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation. Uh, but we're going to go through this scripture, and I want to um, I want to stop along the way and point out a few things to you, because there are some there are some cues in here that we don't necessarily pick up because we're not a part of that culture. And I'm actually going to uh, let's see. I'm going to start in verse three. Because Jesus is leaving, it says he left Judea and returned to Galilee. And that's where we pick up. He had to go through Samaria on the way. 
Now, stop right, stop right there. It says he had to go through Samaria. That's not entirely true. There was another route that he could have taken. Going through Samaria just happens to be the shorter route to Galilee. If you, look, if you take a map and draw a straight line, you'll see it goes through Samaria. And you might ask, why was there another route if, this one's, if there's already a shorter route available? And the reason was that because Jews did not associate with Samaritans. Some, some even took the longer route to avoid going through where they lived, they can, to avoid them altogether. And it wasn't like the Samaritans were just sitting around going, I wonder why nobody wants to play with us. You know, it, they didn't like the Jews either. It's kind of like if you take all the worst, most obnoxious Clemson fans and all the worst, most obnoxious Carolina fans and make them live together. Except it was way worse because many of the Jews even considered it a sin to talk to a Samaritan. Now, Jews, Jews didn't go through Samaria, Samaria excuse me, except Jesus. And many scholars believe that he had to go through Samaria for the specific purpose of meeting the woman that we're about to hear about. And in verse 5, it says, Eventually he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well at noontime. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Now, it clearly said that Jesus was tired from the long walk and sat down wearily. And I'm going to assume that this woman is at least of average intelligence. She can see that this man is tired, probably thirsty, and does not have a bucket or a rope or anything to draw water from the well. In fact, she says that in a couple of verses. So why did she say, why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus is probably thinking, because I don't have a bucket. Look, you know. We know Jesus can get the water if he wants it, right? But she doesn't know that. Jesus tends to like to ease into the conversation. Now, many Jewish teachings at the time warned against talking to women in general, and especially with Samaritan women. And here's the, here's the best part, y'all. Some ancient accounts show that a man even asking a woman for a drink could be considered flirting with her. That doesn't sound like flirting to me. In fact, Isaac met his wife at a well. Jacob met his wife at a well. That precedent has been set. And they're there alone. I, I, I doubt Jesus was like, hey girl, let me get a drink. <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? I, I just don't see him doing that. You know, we laugh, we think that sounds silly. But in this culture, you know, we know this is Jesus. But in this culture, she doesn't know who this is. She doesn't know about his death and resurrection. She has no idea who she's talking to. So she says, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? And in verse 10, Jesus replied, if you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. But, sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? She takes a little bit of a jab at Jesus and at the Jews right here. And again, we don't pick that up because we don't know the culture. She says, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob? The Jews believed that they were the direct descendants of Jacob and that the Samaritans were, at best, half-breeds. 
Now, she claims common ancestry, which is a direct affront to that belief. But Jesus doesn't even flinch at it. He doesn't even respond to it. He's got much more important things to get to. And I think that's a sign for us that when we're sharing the gospel with someone, it's possible that you could get some insults thrown at you. Or maybe just a little sly comment. Somebody tries to slide in there. But Jesus doesn't even address it. He just continues on. Verse 13, Jesus replied, Anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water. Then I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water. Please, sir, give me this water. Have you ever felt that way? One of the things we listed earlier that we thirst for is fulfillment. You know, we want, we want our life to mean something. Have you ever had the thought, this can't be it? Am I just supposed to work, pay bills, and die? There's got to be something more. And I know you're sitting in church right now, but it's okay if you've ever felt that way. Just because you know about Jesus doesn't mean you're not human. Even your pastors will tell you. We feel that way sometimes. Am I even making a difference? What am I doing here, God? Why do I always have to be working? Why do I have to answer a million questions a day for my four-year-old? Why does my two-year-old insist on throwing as much water out of the tub as possible? Why, why don't any of my kids want to sleep at night? Why, God? Why do I now sound like my four-year-old asking a million questions? Can I ever just have a little fun? Can't I ever just rest? Please, sir, give me this water. The woman wants to be filled and never thirst again. But she's only thinking about that physical thirst. So while he has her attention, Jesus cuts right to the point. In verse 16, he says, go and get your husband. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. And before I continue, I just want to stop and ask, how do you think she said that? You know, we only have the words there. We don't have her tone of voice. Sometimes things can get lost if it's just the words. How many of you guys have ever sent your wife or your girlfriend a text and she totally misunderstood it? I have. <laughs> oh, hey, honey, you are the most beautiful woman in this world. This world? What do you mean this world? What world are you living in? <laughs> Sometimes tone of voice matters. And I just wonder how she said, I have no husband. Do you think it was like, I have no husband? And throw him a wink? I mean, we already know that she may have thought he was flirting with her. Where are the teenage guys at in here? I know I see some of them around. You know you've done this before. The cute girl asks you to do something, and you're like, why don't you get your boyfriend to do it? Because you want her to say, I don't have a boyfriend. <laughs> but you were going to do it anyway. You know, okay, enough of that. Back in verse 17, Jesus said, you're right. You don't have a husband, for you have had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. Okay, now we know she came to the well alone and not with other women. Probably because none of them liked her, for her because of her reputation. She's had five husbands. And she's living with a guy she's not married to now. And you might have missed this because we kind of just glossed right over it. But um, what time of day was it? It was noon. It was in verse 6. 
when you picture the middle of Israel or just the Middle East in general, as far as the landscape goes, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Rock, desert. That's what I think of, desert. Now, why on earth would she venture out at noon, the hottest part of the day, in the desert? Amen. She's ashamed to be seen. Normally, the women would go early in the morning to get water, but this woman couldn't because that's when all the other women went. She says, I have no husband. And Jesus resp responds, you're right. You've had five husbands, and you're living with a guy you're not married to. Then we see her start to understand what's happening in verse 19, because this, this is a stranger to her. She doesn't know who this is. But all of a sudden, she realizes he knows everything about her. Verse 19, sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. So tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship while we Samaritans claim it is here at Mount Gerizim where our ancestors worshipped? Jesus replied, Believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship Him in that way. For God is spirit, so those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who, who, the one who is called Christ. When He comes, He will explain everything to us. All that stuff that Jesus just said, and all she heard was four words, you know very little. He said, you Samaritans know very little. And she responds, I know the Messiah is coming. She's, she's just, all she heard was, you know very little. And she's just responding to that. She said, I know the Messiah is coming. So in verse 26, Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Now after this, the lady takes off to her village to tell everyone what just happened. And she doesn't even take her water jar or jug with her. She just leaves it. And the people start coming out of the village to see Jesus because they see this woman who's been filled. Now, have you ever thought, have you ever had the thought, Jesus, just please come back now. My life is in shambles. I, everybody hates me. I want you to hurry up and get here and make everything okay again. This woman certainly had. She said, I know the Messiah is coming. She was ready. Are you ready? Are you thirsty? Is there really any question where you can get that living water? It comes from Jesus. You can't buy it, and you can't find it. Only Jesus can give it to you. Now, this week, um, during my personal Bible reading, I just happened to come across a few scriptures that, that show that Jesus provides the living water. In Isaiah 49.10, it says, They will neither hunger nor thirst. The searing sun will not reach them anymore. For the Lord in His mercy will lead them. He will lead them beside cool waters. And then even more directly in John 7, verse 37 and 38, it says, On the last day, the climax of the festival, Jesus stood and shouted to the crowds, Anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare, Rivers of living water will flow from his heart. Are you thirsty? Come to me, Jesus says. Come and drink. Now, I want to I invite you to come. We're going um, to have a time where 
you can come up, and we've got the baskets up here. You can place the special offering for the, um, for the hurricane relief help. And at that time, if you'd like to come for prayer, I'm going to step down over here. John's going to be over here. It's a perfect opportunity to have someone pray with you or pray for you. And look, there's nothing wrong with coming for prayer. We all need prayer. But if you feel like you need to come, come. Don't let Satan talk you out of it.